want to just talk for a few minutes this morning about this. Why does God from time to time, why does he give us some sort of special or unique experience of his presence? From time to time, you and I will experience a very special, real, profound, unique touch from God. Why does God do that? So I'm going to jump to the end of the message this morning, and I'm probably not going to be able to teach it all the way I maybe would like to this morning because of just, you know, time frame between services. But let me take a couple of minutes to just unpack that. But I want to go to the conclusion, and then I'll come back and I'll do the conclusion again because I believe this is the word. I, I heard it. Uh, Greg said it up front from Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run the race with perseverance. Uh, our other young lady said it, we walk by, by faith, not by sight. I believe that's really the, what the Holy Spirit is wanting to say today. But there are times when you and I have unique experiences of God. Maybe it's an overwhelming sense of the Lord's presence. Anybody ever experienced that? Maybe it's an overwhelming sense of his love for us. Or there have been times in my life when I was praying and I would get a, just an overwhelming sense of the holiness of God. And I would fall on my face. Not in fear. Just the overwhelming sense of his holiness. Or a verse of scripture comes bursting into our minds. And we go, wow. And we see it in a brand new way. Anybody with me? All kinds of ways that the Lord can give us unique experiences. Would you say that? I know this is cheesy to say words. I don't like to do this a lot, but would you say unique with me? Because that means it's not the norm. That's the key thought here. The Lord gave Peter, James, and John a very unique experience of his presence. In Matthew chapter 16, it says that Jesus talked to them about taking up their cross and following him and dying to themselves and losing their life. And then He talked about his coming. We'll look at that verse in just a minute. Jesus said, but I'm coming. I'm going to come in the Father's glory. And then the next verse says, and then a few days later, Jesus selected Peter, James, and John, just the three of them, not all 12, just the three, and he took them up on a mountain. And the Bible says in Matthew 17 and verse number 1, it says in that text, I said I was going to go to the end, didn't I? Sorry. So here's the end that I was going to go to, and then I'll come back. Uh, Hebrews 10, 36 says, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, I like one translation, it reads it like this. You need to persevere so that after having done the will of God, after you do the will of God, you still need to persevere. You need to still need to keep believing so that you may receive what he promised. So in chapter 17, they go up on the mountain. It says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he led them to a high mountain by themselves. And there, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. And there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, this is awesome. Let's just keep doing this. This is great. Let me build three tabernacles. Let's just hang out here. Well, that's kind of what he said. I mean, that's not exactly what he said. That was kind of the heart and the intent. It says in verse 5 that while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And while they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Why does God give us special revelations of his presence from time to time? Well, sometimes it's just to encourage us in the strategic life that he's called you and I to. Why Peter, James, and John? Why not all of them? Why not Matthew? Why not Nathaniel? 
Why not Thomas? After all, wasn't he doubting Thomas? Now, why Peter, James, and John? Did Jesus love them more? No. They were going to play very strategic roles. Peter's going to become the leader of the church. James is going to be the first martyr. He's going to, he's going to get his head chopped off in just a few days. And John's going to live the longest and write the book of Revelation. And so Jesus gave these three individuals a unique experience for them to strengthen them and encourage them to carry out their ministry, what God had for them to do, but everybody wasn't going to do the same thing. God's got unique path for each one of us, and sometimes he will quicken things to us just simply to encourage us. He knows our hearts. He knows our needs. He knows what's in the future, so he prepares us with some special things. Why does God give us special revelation? Sometimes just to encourage us. Secondly, I think he does it to inspire an eternal perspective and an eternal lifestyle. In other words, it says in chapter 16, Jesus made it very plain. Listen to what he said in chapter 16, verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, that is deny their fleshly self, deny their sin, deny their, their feelings, deny their, their wants at times. And they have to take up their cross. They've got to die to themselves and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good is it if you gain the whole world but you forfeit your soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul, said Jesus. And then listen to verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then... Everybody say then. And then he will reward you. When does God reward us? When Jesus comes. What Jesus wants to do when he gives us those special moments of, of showing us his glory, of letting us experience the reality of something beyond this life, what he's doing is reminding us we don't get rewards in this life. The extra blessings, the extra finances, the extra opportunities, those unique things that God gives us, those are not rewards. We don't get rewarded in this life. That's not what the Bible teaches. No, the Bible says we get rewarded in the life to come. So what are those blessings, promotions, extra dollars? What are those? Those are more resources to use for God's honor and glory in this life. Looking forward to the reward we will have in eternity. Are you with me this morning? The Lord wants to develop in you and me the ability to look beyond the right here and now and to live for his coming, to live for the glory of when he comes with the Father's angels and there's an eternal kingdom. We've got to get beyond living for the now and Jesus gives us those moments so we'll realize we need to live for more than right now we got to live for that day when he is coming are you with me this morning you know the apostle Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15 he said if in this life only we have hope as believers in Christ we're to be pitied over all people now why would he say that well because in Paul's day when you gave your life to Christ and you were all out for Jesus, you got persecuted. Sometimes you lost your job. Your family ostracized you, would have anything to do with you. And guess what? That day is coming, isn't it? Back circling back around. What Jesus is doing in those special moments is preparing us to live with an eternal perspective. This life is not all there is. We don't look for reward in this life. So when things aren't going well, when the plan's not working out, when, because listen, the disciples, for them, the, it wasn't going according to plan, right? It's not what they were thinking. That's not what they signed up for. And so Jesus gives them this moment. He reveals the glory of who he actually is to reaffirm to them that it's eternal glory they need to live for, not earthly glory and reward. Are you with me? So we need to persevere. Why does he do it? Well, he does it to just encourage us. He does it to remind us of eternity. He does it to reaffirm biblical truth and authority in our lives. This is so important. This is an important one. Look at verse 4 or 3 again. It says that Moses and Elijah appeared and were talking to Jesus. Why did God let them see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus? Why is that important? 
Well, because I may not quit as quick as you would like me to, so I'm just saying. And you can stay. I love you. They're keeping me on my toes, so I'll quit on time. Let me regroup and think of what I was saying. (laughs) Yeah, why Moses and Elijah? Because Moses and Elijah represented the writings of the Scripture. Moses, the writer of the first five books, and Elijah, one of the greatest prophets, they represented the law and the prophets. Why did Jesus do that? Why did Father God give them that glimpse? Because he was reiterating to them, listen, when everything else in your life is crazy, when nothing makes sense, when everything else is wrong, you go back to the scriptures, your faith is rooted in the scripture and the character of God, not in your experiences, goosebumps, or circumstances. You've got to be rooted in the scriptures. That's why it's important to know it. And to let God speak to us. Because here's the truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is fixed. And it is recorded in the word of God. We have to be firmly rooted in the revelation and teaching of the scriptures. The promises of the word of God. Or listen, we will be fooled by experiences and feelings and false signs. There is a real power in the evil one. And he can perform false signs. There will come a day when there will be lots of false miracles that will, why are they false? Because they don't actually happen. No, they are false because they make people believe things that aren't true. They believe in something other than God and in his son, Jesus Christ. We've got to be firmly rooted in the scripture. So Jesus gives us those moments in order to drive us back to the Word of God and really be rooted in the Scripture. Listen, if the feeling or the experience or the the motivation, the desire that you you seem to be overwhelmed with, if, if if it's not consistently according to the teaching of the Scripture, if it doesn't fit and reinforce what the Bible says, It's a lie, no matter how good it feels. We sing the old song, In Christ Alone, and it says in that that song, it says, I dare not trust the sweetest. We sing uh, the word frame, F-R-A-M-E. In other words, I dare not trust the sweetest person, no matter how buff or beautiful. I, I can't trust. I think in the old, I think the actual original word was frain, F-R-A-I-N, meaning I can't trust the sweetest things that people say. I trust in Christ alone in his teaching. Why does he give us special experiences of his presence? Drive us back to the word of God to reinforce the word. And if those experiences don't confirm the word of God, they are not from God. That's how we know I got to just quick, quick. So he does it to motivate obedience that falls on the heels, it says in this text, uh, that uh, in verse 4 and 5, it says, uh, Peter saying, hey, Lord, it's great to be here. And what does God say? Be quiet, Peter, and listen. And in the Hebrew scriptures, the word listen always means not just hear. It always means obey. Obedience is the sign of genuine faith. Obedience is the sign of genuine faith. Disobedience is a sign of unbelief. That's always true in the scriptures. In the book of Hebrews, as we looked a few minutes ago, that's, that's what it says. So the Lord gives us those, those encouragements. He gives us those revelations. He gives us those experiences. He, he lets us have that. Why? So we'll go back to the word of God and obey it to practice what it has to say. Number five, to instill proper fear and appreciation of grace. The the shadow comes, God speaks, and what do the disciples do? They hear the voice of God like the people at Sinai. It scares the wits out of them, and they hit the ground. They're, They're, oh, my God. And so 
Why does God give us revelation? To instill a proper fear in our hearts. How many of you are grateful we do not, as followers of Christ, we do not have to be afraid of God? Aren't you glad for that? You know, when I was a kid growing up, my dad was, was a good man. He, he did a lot of good things, and, and he was a disciplinarian. I was never afraid of my dad because I knew my dad loved me. I, I wasn't afraid of him, but, boy, I had fear, right? I respected my dad because I knew he could take his belt off back in those days. You know, he'd get arrested now, but back in those days, you could use your belt, you know. Are you with me? He never actually hit me with it. He'd just take it off and slap it a couple of times. That was all I needed. But how many of you see the difference? Proper respect. And so they fear. They, God reveals himself. They fall on their face with a reverence, and yet Jesus touches them and relieves that fear with his loving touch. Isn't that awesome? And they look up, and they see no one except Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Grace isn't amazing until we realize how holy God is and how sinful we are. When God reveals to us how sinful we really are and how holy he really is, grace becomes really amazing. That's why he gives us those moments. To reveal his character, his heart, his person. Instill that proper fear. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. That's what's happened right here. You with me? Let's let's wrap up quickly. Uh, Number six, to develop an exclusive focus and dependence on Jesus. When they lifted their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. And that's why God gives us those moments, so that we will just trust in Jesus and no one else and no thing else. That we don't trust in anything else but Christ alone. We put our hope. We say, he is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. And number seven, last. I'm wrapping up now, guys. You can come on out. Um, He does it to clarify his word and his plan for our life. That's verses 9 through 13. It says after that, as they're coming down the mountain, the the disciples say, Jesus, we don't don't totally get it. uh, They they say, the scripture says, that Elijah's got to come first before, before the kingdom. What's going on here? And Jesus explains to them. He helps them to understand that John the Baptist fulfilled that role and that in the future day, there are some scholars who believe that Elijah will in fact still come before the second coming of Christ. That's debated. But Jesus explains, he gives them clarity into the word of God and clarity about what he wants them to do. I remember one time, uh, I've had many experiences throughout my, my years not all together and not as often as I would like. I hope you heard that. But from time to time, God would do something. And uh, there was a time when I was sitting on a platform wanting to pastor my own church, and, and uh, David Wilkerson was preaching at the church that day. In those days, we sat on the platform. It was excruciating. You had to sit there you know, and act like you were interested, even if you weren't, because everybody's looking at you. You know what I'm saying? But I was interested. Dave was doing a great job. But in the middle of Dave Wilkerson preaching, the Holy Spirit spoke into my mind. I didn't hear it with these ears, but I heard it in my mind as if he was speaking directly to me. It was a voice. He said, it will be two years before I have ready what I want you to do. Clear as a bell. God was giving me a special moment. I had been seeking him. I'd been praying. I'd been asking him what to do. He gave me a special moment of revelation to clarify to me I needed to put my patience on and wait. How many of you didn't want to hear that one? But anyway, that was the word. Are you with me? So why does he do it? To strengthen and encourage our faith, to inspire eternal perspective and lifestyle, to reaffirm biblical truth and authority, to motivate humble obedience, to instill proper fear and gratitude, to develop an exclusive focus and dependence on Jesus, to clarify God's word and plan for our lives. But here's the point. So what? What do we do? Listen, here's the crux of it. You and I have to learn to live by faith, not by sight. 
We live by faith in God and his word, not by special experiences of his presence. Because the simple fact is, those don't always come. I don't have a special experience of God's presence every single day. And listen to me, you you don't have to have some special revelation for every single decision you make in your life. Your Father loves you. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you practical wisdom through the teaching and the the counsel of the church. He's given you spiritual wisdom through the Word of God. You, You don't have to have a voice from heaven to just make good decisions, manage your money well, love your family, do your job like you ought to, and just live life. You just get up and you trust God and you trust his sovereignty and you seek him with all your heart. And if he gives you a special revelation, you praise him and you thank him for it. But if he doesn't, you just keep walking in faith. You just persevere and you put one foot in front of the other one. You feel like you're pulling a Mack truck sometimes. Oh, I'm going to keep pulling that truck for Jesus. I'm going to trust him because in the future, Jesus is coming. I'm living for eternity and bless God. Then he will reward me and then I will be all that he intends me. Are you with me this morning? Come on, let's stand and give him praise. Stand and give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're able. You're awesome. You're good. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your kindness. We praise you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are faithful whether we feel it, see it or not. You are God. You are in charge. You're directing our steps. You're going to help us today. We need perseverance so that having done the will of God, we may receive what he has promised. It goes on to say, for he who is coming will come. He who is coming will come and will not delay. So, Father, strengthen us for the day. In Jesus' name. Well, thanks again for joining us again for Church Online this morning. It really is sincerely our honor and privilege to get to have you online. We're going to enter into a time of worship with response. Feel free that you can respond in whatever way you feel the Lord is leading you. If the message spoke to you in a real and practical way, uh, and if you want to continue worshiping or have a moment of prayer, or also have some next steps of application that you can maybe write down uh, so that you would not only be hearers of this message, but also doers of it. We're always encouraged to hear your story of how God's working in your heart. Uh, Feel free to drop us a line at info at calvarydelran.com. But really, we would love to see you in person next week for service.